You are watching a special meeting of the Eau Claire City Council from Thursday, March 10th, 2011. Before the recording of this meeting started, a motion was made that the City Council go into closed session to discuss potential labor agreements with city unions, bargaining groups, and non-represented employees, which is permitted in closed session, pursuant to Section 19.85, Parent 1, Parent E of Wisconsin Statutes. Following a short discussion, the motion to go into closed session was withdrawn, and the meeting continued in open session. City Council President Kerry Kincaid then read the four resolutions that were before the Council. They were, one, a resolution authorizing the City Manager to execute a collective bargaining agreement between the City and Local 284. Two, a resolution authorizing the City Manager to execute collective bargaining agreement between the City and Amalgamated Transit Local 1310. Three, a resolution authorizing the city manager to execute a collective bargaining agreement between the city and Communication Workers of America, Local 4640. And finally, four, resolution authorizing the city manager to execute agreements between the city and Professional Police Command Group, Local 39, Clerical Technical Supervisory Engineering Association, Department Directors, Division Heads, and confidential employees. Assistant City Attorney Steve Borer was then asked to make a presentation to the Council on these resolutions. Division heads and confidential employees. Mr. Borer, if you would apprise the Council of the status of these negotiations. Uh, thank you. Um, Mike Huggins, uh, Dale Peters, and I and others who were department heads met with the certified unions yesterday. We continued meeting with the meet and confer groups today, minus Dale Peters. <coughs> uh, we have uh, reached uh, tentative agreements with um, all of the groups. Uh, for purposes of the certified unions, they have all voted and ratified their side of the agreement. The two uh, other meet and confer groups uh, have recommended, uh, but have not had a chance to vote. Uh, with, with respect to <coughs> the uh, tentative agreements, the terms of which, I'm going to help on the, the zoom here. Zoom back out again. That's pretty good. <coughs> there are five, uh, there's a typo here. This should be uh, June 30th. There are five uh, aspects of tentative agreements that are common to all of the groups of employees. Uh, and there are additional uh, operational efficiencies that uh, were a part of the agreements with the three certified unions. I'll go through the common five first and then hit the, the three uh, certified unions separately. <coughs> uh, number one, the labor agreement uh, that we currently have with the groups would be extended from the date of ratification, <coughs> which would be uh, now that the unions, the certified unions have voted, uh, it would be uh, uh, upon adoption of resolution and direction for the city manager and clerk to sign uh, management side of the agreement through June 30th of 2013. Number two, effective January 1st, 2012, uh, the city shall contribute 93.5%. Uh, and effective January 1st, 2013, it shall contribute 92.5% of the monthly premium payments toward health insurance contributions. As you may know, <clears throat> the current contribution required amount for employees is 5%. So this, in effect, would require employees to pay an additional 3% on their health insurance premiums. <clears throat> Number three, uh, effective upon ratification of the agreement, the city may make changes in the health plan design of its health insurance program and may change its health insurance provider without bargaining the impacts of such changes. Number four, all employees shall pay the employee's share of WRS at such time as the employer is prohibited from paying the employee's share by state law. Any future employer contributions towards employee's share must be bargained as permitted by uh, state law. <clears throat> what that means is that when the state determines, uh, and as far as I know, uh, the, the assembly is set to 
hear this at 11 o'clock this morning in Madison, uh, which is the WRS contribution uh, would be a part of that, the prohibition rather. Uh, if the governor then signs, it would become effective. Uh, that's the date when that law becomes effective would be the date that this uh, provision would kick in for these employees. And currently that uh, provision would, would uh, no longer allow the city to contribute the employee share of 5.8%. So that would require employees to pay that uh, uh, towards the pension plan. And finally, number five, effective July 1st of 2011, employees would receive a 1.5% wage increase or CPI, which stands for Consumer Price Index, otherwise known as cost of living, whichever amount is greater. Uh, same thing for the following year, effective July 1st, 2012. <clears throat> the purpose of number five is to give the benefit to employees if there is a higher CPI rate, which is currently uh, thought to be 1.5, they would get that benefit of a wage increase. <clears throat> Are there any questions as to the uh, summary of the five major aspects for uh, the attentive agreements for the uh, for the certified unions as well as the meet and confer and the non representatives Questions for Mr. Ford? Councilmember Jeffs? Uh, Mr. Board, I wonder if you could explain <clears throat> one of the things that came up last week when we had a uh, regional meeting of the municipalities down in Durand is uh, Attorney Steve Weld uh, uh, gave a little program where he explained some of the provisions of the proposed law as we knew them. Now, I realize this hasn't been adopted yet, and I, uh, I have not seen the actual language and gone through it. But <clears throat> one of the questions came up is when we have agreements with so-called non-certified unions, such as I assume would include CTSEs, Department of Directors, Division Heads, and so forth. That's correct. That uh, he mentioned in response to a question, best I can recall, when asked how do we handle these things, he said, "You you do the." I said, "Can we enter into agreements?" And he said, "No." And I said, "Well, what are you supposed to do?" And he said, "Well, you as management, you can do unilaterally what you did by agreement before." So my technical question is: Is an agreement such as this? going to be in conflict with this proposed law, and I realize this is speculating, but is this going to be valid or must we take some different action uh, to extend these, uh, I'll call them understandings, because I don't want to use the word agreement, but you know, whatever they are. So maybe you could kind of walk through that, because I think the certified agreements are pretty clear uh, under the law, but this one is an area, to me at least, was a little gray. Well, first of all, I was not in Duran to hear Mr. Weld comment, so I, I can't speak with knowledge about that. Uh, but I uh, would disagree with the conclusion, whatever was heard, that uh, management at the city cannot agree with non-certified groups. They certainly can, they just can't negotiate. That might be a distinction that he was trying to make. Uh, I would agree with what I just said, that they uh, certainly could uh, uh, sit down with groups of non-certified employees and make agreements. Now, it, in answer to your question, does this, what is, we're looking at, conflict with any, anything in the law? The answer is no. So, in other words, in short, <clears throat> if this was adopted as written in an agreement form and signed by the parties uh, mentioned here, that the, the law would not supersede it and say, sorry, you can't extend these provisions, uh, that, that isn't permitted. That, that was my concern, is that the enforceability of this or the, uh, and I don't know what agency would be even enforcing at the state level, but it, is this protected from challenge, I guess I would say, then in a, in a court as being, uh, it's, it, is its validity sound, it would, could withstand a challenge? as you understand the provisions of that bill, Senate Bill 11? Well, of course we know that uh, that bill is still under review and it, there's some hypothetical uh, nature to what's going to finally end up uh, to be that law, which appears to be going forward. Um, uh, I don't believe that there, it, it, that there would be a problem in conflict. Now, you have to realize that uh, 
the bill as it's set up to go through would impact non-certified employees such that, for example, the WRS contribution would go into effect the pay period immediately following March 13. Uh, that, would, uh, that would be uh, in agreement with these uh, points, specifically uh, for those uh, who are both in the certified and non-certified groups, uh, where it says the um, the WRS contribution shall not kick in uh, until the state law uh, requires it. So at, at the same time, when the state law requires the uh, non-representatives or non-protective uh, people without contracts, uh, this will also affect our employees who are under contracts as well as our employees who are not under contracts. So in answer to your question, I, I don't believe that the law as proposed would uh, be a problem in court. Now, for those who are in certified bargaining units, their contribution to WRS starts on July 1st. <coughs> their contribution uh, to, uh, WRS. to the WRS would be as proposed, um, which would, for the certified unions, would, yeah. would occur on the date that that law becomes effective for uh, non-represented employees. And, and employees in non-certified um, uh, groups or associations. So July 1st is not the date. It would be uh, effective whenever that date becomes okay. I, I misunderstood that published. I thought we were carrying that through the end of the contract period. Okay. No, the employees, in fact, that, that's a, a big aspect of, of this tentative agreement was that uh, they were willing to make that contribution uh, Immediately, when well, that law becomes, I'm, I'm if that law becomes effective. Glad to have that clarification on the you know, record. My question is about the health insurance. As we know, uh, both representative and non-representative groups are not part of the state health plan. Therefore, those rules, that law, would not impact our groups. That's correct. And that's why I, I would imagine why we can uh, change the design and the programs. And is that not correct? That is true. As the bill is now proposed, uh, it would only impact those in the state insurance health plan. And as you know, we are self-funded, and that would not apply to us. Uh, however, the tentative agreement, as I already indicated, would require an increased employee contribution of 1.5% per year. Going along with that, I, I think, again, I'm going to reference Steve Well because we were all there. And he was talking about the non-representative group in terms of health, and it was saying that they cannot pay more than 88%. And so I'm wondering how that impacts, being that you have them included in the representative group. Well, again, I wasn't there, but uh, if Mr. Weld said that, he probably was referring to those who are not uh, uh, employed by the city or who are not em employed by a public employer that is uh, self-funded. your staff for your not only ability but willingness to put all this together on such a short time frame and and to do such a solid job of it that's extremely commendable <clears throat> my question is very straightforward does this proposed um, contractual agreement uh, incorporate all the relative or sorry relevant uh, financial concessions proposed by the governor in the original budget repair bill, i.e. the additional contributions to uh, the Wisconsin retirement system and so on. <coughs> this agreement would include the uh, same proposal with respect to the WRS pension contribution, yes. <coughs> it would not include the stripping of other uh, kinds of collective bargaining rights. These agreements would continue the collective bargaining rights for other aspects of uh, the various agreements, in particular the certified agreements, with such examples as seniority, vacation, sick leave. But given the Senate's vote, we have to assume that there are no financial ramifications of those actions. Otherwise, they would have been required to have a more significant majority or a more significant um, quorum. 
for those to have occurred. Otherwise, it would be a violation of Local 16 law. I would tend to agree. Okay, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> thank you. I'll leave it there. Are there questions? Council Member Watts? Um, <clears throat> In terms of the inter interplay or interrelationship between these agreements and the Federal 13C um, provisions with regard to transit, have you an opinion uh, as to whether or not this will dovetail with the transit, uh, with protection of the transit funds from the federal government? It's an excellent question, and that, that is a, a big part of this agreement. Um, as you know, 13C is a, a federal regulation which has now been renumbered, I believe it's 5,333, that requires uh, upon submission of federal grant money that uh, employee groups uh, maintain uh, what they have in place for purposes of collective bargaining rights. We, believed, we, we believe that if the um, bill would go through prior to extending a contract that uh, the employees affected in the certified group of transit uh, would be significantly at risk at losing the, at, at the conclusion that their collective bargaining rights are being affected. Therefore, uh, losing that, uh, uh, there's a much higher risk in losing that federal funding, which I believe is a very high percentage. I'm wondering, as far as individual contracts or administrative and support staff, according to the information that I've been reading, that it has its constitutional protections in that no law impairing the obligation of contracts shall ever be passed. So, it, in other words, there would be no impact to that unit by this budget bill. Am I not correct? It's my understanding that if the council uh, approves this resolution giving authority to the city manager and city clerk to enter this agreement and if these agreements are uh, done before the uh, bill proposed becomes effective then uh, they are good through June 30th of 2013 and those contracts remain protected. So do we have individual contracts here? We have individual contracts with the same groups that we've described, the, the certified groups and agreements with the meet and confer groups, yes. And we are essentially lapping off a couple of months uh, because those agreements were to run through June 30th of 2011. And we're going to begin them uh, if the council approves uh, as soon as, as possibly today. Do you have um, uh, just a few, presentation, I Just a few more points. I do want to point out to Council that um, uh, we did achieve some additional operational efficiencies, which I commend the uh, various unions for being willing to do to assist the city in what uh, will continue to be financial challenge. Uh, for purposes of the, the communication workers, they have agreed to additional efficiencies to make permanent a new shift procedure. They've reorganized the way in which they uh, do shifts and how they offer draws and time off. Um, we will not have to uh, bargain over that aspect. Uh, transit, uh, they, the, that group of employees has agreed uh, that um, uh, certain uh, employees can be scheduled Monday through Saturday without overtime, which will uh, also produce ad additional savings. Uh, third, the DPW group, which comprises of the streets employees and parks employees, have agreed that uh, the city may assign union work to non-union employees at Hobbs uh, with certain um, uh, securities that we will not affect uh, that full-time employment or diminution of hours for those employees assigned at Hobbs. And finally, uh, the operational efficiencies I, I need to point out with the other two groups, the Police Command and CTSEA, are already in place. Um, we uh, have the ability to uh, reach uh, efficiencies if we need them. So those uh, efficiencies are also a part of uh, these major points, and they're uh, attached separately to the individual agreements. Did that elicit further questions? Council Member 
Thank you, Madam President. Thank you again, Mr. Boer, for your presentation. May I ask how many employees are affected by these contractual changes, approximately? Um, approximately. Approximately 500. Approximately 500. So am I correct in my understanding that in under, what, 72 hours, we were able to renegotiate contracts with approximately 100 employees? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, 500 employees? 500 employees, yes. Okay. Uh, and not, not an hour, it was... Uh, no, 72 hours. 72 hours, uh, approximately, yes. Okay. Would it be possible to renegotiate contracts with approximately 500 employees, in your opinion, individually within 72 hours? Uh, not typically. I, I think the circumstances that are all in front of us right now has, has been uh, the impetus for uh, this speed um, uh, in which we've taken. Certainly, certainly. I, I, I merely wish to, to attempt to understand the potential efficiencies that might be realized by collective bargaining arrangements, and it appears that there are some efficiencies that have been realized. Thank That's you correct. very much. Point of information, uh, yeah. Mr. Nick? Yeah. Well, I just wanted to make uh, one clarification, not, not to diminish the, uh, the quick and substantial work uh, that, that was accomplished. Uh, in, in round numbers, we have 500 total employees. The number of employees affected by the agreements before is approximately 350, I would put it at, noting that uh, the other 150 of our employees are protective service employees with collective bargaining agreements, and uh, they're not affected by uh, the pending state legislation. We will have contracts up for renewal uh, with those groups, and uh, we didn't initiate uh, negotiations with them yet, but we will soon. I stand corrected. I was thinking of the other uh, non-reps and adding them to the group of, of people here. So yes, the two police unions, uh, the, this, uh, the, the police and fire unions, this does not uh, impact at all. For total affected employees by what the work we're doing today is about 350 that's, of our 500. That's correct. Understandable. Everyone's nervous and trying to do the right thing, so. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Park. I see no further questions. I believe the proper procedure is to vote on these four items individually. And therefore, uh, the chair will seek a motion to move item one. Moved by Council Member Olson, seconded by Council Member Kemp. Item one is moved. Is there a discussion? Council Member Duex? I just want to say something before we vote on these resolutions. I can't tell you how uh, disappointing it is as a person who's been in public service for many years to have to see us come rush in at 10 o'clock in the morning, do this, on very little notice. I think we have to put this in kind of some historical perspective. We've had two city council meetings that have been called as urgent to our notice. The open meetings law of the state of Wisconsin requires that we give 24 hour notice of any meeting, except uh, there's a rather broad thing that says that uh, we can have a meeting uh, for, if for good cause such notice is impossible or impractical. Uh, and what is good cause? And what is uh, impossible or impractical notice? Just yesterday, the state legislative committee that uh, rushed through a bill through the, it was a joint conference committee, I believe. They uh, gave a barely two hour notice. And uh, attorney Robert Dreps, an expert in media and political law stated that he felt exceptions to the 24 hour notice uh, are impossible or impractical. He says it raises a lot of serious questions. I don't think they can satisfy the standard for giving such short notice for that meeting. I feel a lot of that about what we're doing. And I have a big lump in my throat about voting so soon instead of at 6 o'clock tonight. I want to just confess to you that my preference would be to wait until 6 o'clock when we did give our 24-hour notice. And I understand there are those in the audience, many of you that I know, who say, hey, their uh, speed is of the utmost uh, urgency here because of the <coughs> impending, perhaps, action of our legislature. I think that former State Representative Jeff Smith 
who's in our audience tonight would agree with what Senator Tim Cullen of Janesville said in today's uh, Wisconsin State Journal. He said, we just don't, he said, we would like all the lawmakers to take a step back. We just don't know what's going on, he said. We don't know what is legal. I think we all just need to press pause. Democracy does not have to move this fast. And I would say to that, amen. I agree with that totally. I think what we've seen in the last few weeks is a travesty on our democracy. It treads upon everything we believe on, and the shared values we have, speeding up, early morning meetings, late night meetings, rush to judgment, making mistakes when you're in a hurry. And frankly, the reason I'm asking questions about this today is to make sure we aren't making some mistakes today. And I know our staff have worked very hard on it. We're all up against this speed thing. We've been sucked into something we it is driving us. When we started this meeting, we pledged allegiance to the flag, and we said, for justice for all. Uh, we, saw, we all of us took an oath of office to, to defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Wisconsin. The Constitution of the State of Wisconsin says that all justice shall be uh, accorded freely, without delay, promptly, and and I've always believed in that. I used to have a plaque that said that in my office. I'm sorry, I can't do it from memory right now. But this goes against everything I believe in and I think many of you believe in as well, those in the audience and here in the council. So it's with great reluctance that I vote at this hour uh, on contracts because I think we have not done our due diligence with respect to timing and giving good notice. So I apologize to the media and to the public in general that we're doing it this quickly. Um, I realize some may disagree with me because the statute that I quoted about the dangers of a two hour, or the parameters of a two hour notice uh, has never had an opinion rendered and no court cases. So there's not much help. I think that's something that ought to be worked on. So I want to express before I just end by saying appreciation uh, to our legal staff, our human resources staff, and all of those who have worked on it, and to the representatives of our uh, certified bargaining units and the other units that are signing agreements. We realize that you were put under some manner of, shall we say, the duress of time, and the strain shows on your faces. The strain is on our faces, too. Uh, this is not what government should be about. So, again, thank you for your efforts. Madam. Thank you. Madam President, the press of business is, is uh, somewhat burdensome today, and the time is of the essence. I wonder if we could take the vote. Mm -hmm. <coughs> we, under, we understand that we um, this is a difficult issue um, for all of us. Any other discussion on resolution on item one? Councilmember Pasky. I, I only want to say briefly, there are there are certainly some concerns that I share with Councilmember Dewex. I've been thinking about this all night because they don't want to make the same mistake that's being made currently in Madison. I believe in that process, the democratic process too, and that none of us are all knowing as to in terms of what will happen as a result of that repair budget. I just don't think it meets the intent of the law. I mean, I've been disturbed about the 24-hour notice. I noticed in today's paper, legal challenge likely over short notice. It just seems like those protections were put in place for a very good reason. And that is to assure that we have uh, open openness and transparency and the ability to discuss these issues. And this is important for our city, this issue here, very important. And I know the importance of human resources and people, and we want those protections in place. But I, I don't know if if this is about accomplishing what I, what I hope. And I, I just want you to know up front, those are my hesitancies, those are my concerns, and I appreciate the ability to say that. Thank you. Another discussion, Councilmember. Just very quickly, I, I'd like to say that that uh, I, I share those concerns. However, I, I feel even more strongly that the quickness in which this body has been able to act, as well as our city staff, as well as our bargaining units, demonstrates the tremendous efficiencies that this city operates with and that the employees of this city operate with. That we are able to protect this city from 
I'll say it, the reckless action that is occurring down in Madison on short notice. I think that, that demonstrates the strength of this city, and I am extremely proud to be able to serve on the city council at this moment in time. Further discussion? The chair herself wishes to say that it looks like this may indeed be, I hope I don't dare say the wrong thing, uh, the last collective bargaining agreement we will make in the public sector in our city. As such, I do so today and plan to support these resolutions to give us time to prepare for a new working relationship in a calm and responsible manner. Councilmember Kemp just noted that our city is, is a city that works. And this is a, a further demonstration of that very fact. As such, in my view, the resolutions we are passing today are conservative and appropriate and move to preserve the stability of our city organization. Just like we reacted and helped the private sector in the past when there was a demand shock such that not only the demand curve went down, but the whole demand curve shifted down by the loss of people's incomes when the Uniroyal plant closed we helped the private sector by creating the Economic Development Fund, by working with displaced workers, and by helping Uniroyal to rebirth itself as what is now Banbury Place. I see this action today as another example of us helping um, our entire city by responding to a loss of job, a loss of income, and the immediate impacts that it would have on small businesses and the local economy. That is only one reason. I hope I have explained in somewhat clarity for my uh, support for these resolutions today. Seeing no further discussion, uh, clerk, please call the roll on item one. Councilmember Bailo. Aye. Duax. Aye. Kemp. Aye. Kincaid. Aye. Olson. Aye. Pavelski. Aye. Von Hayden. Aye. Vu. Aye. Watts. Aye. Workman. Aye. That resolution passes. Item two is a resolution, resolution with the amalgamated transit local 1310. The chair seeks the mover. Council with, um, moved by council member Worthman, seconded by council member Olson. Discussion? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Council member Duax? Aye. Kemp? Aye. Kincaid? Aye. Olson? Aye. Pavelski? Aye. Von Hayden? Aye. Vu? Aye. Wax? Aye. Worthman? Aye. Bailo? Aye. The resolution <coughs> passes. Item three is a resolution entering into agreement with the Communication Workers of America, Local 4640. The chair seeks a mover. Moved by Councilmember Duex. Seconded by Councilmember Von Hayden. Discussion? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Kemp? Aye. Kincaid? Aye. Olson? Aye. Pavelski? Aye. Von Hayden? Aye. Vu? Aye. Wax? Aye. Worthman? Aye. Bailo? Aye. Duex? Aye. That resolution passes. And finally, a resolution entering into agreement with Local 39's CTSEA Department Directors, Division Heads, and Confidential Employees. The Chair seeks a mover. Councilmember Kemp and Wax. Councilmember Wax. Clerk, please call the roll. Oh, discussion. <laughs> yeah, Councilmember Olson. I just, uh, before we vote on this final resolution, make a comment that um, a lot of the savings that we're seeing in these contracts that we don't give Governor Walker the credit for it. We've been talk. I've been talking with union leaders before this, and we knew that concessions were going to be made. This rush the process. It took away actually some of their collective collective bargaining rights by doing so. And I just wanted to make sure that the credit goes to our bargaining groups for these concessions and not to the governor. 
Councilmember Kowalski. Thank you. Um, I guess this one bothers me probably a, a little bit in the sense that I do not know the details of this one. It just seems so sight unseen in terms of what this really means. My question is what's included and um, is the individual contracts included in this one? It's just, um, I don't know where you get the answers or if there are answers, but I, I just think that this is a group that does not is not represented except for Local 39. There's a lot of there that is not. And so um, whether it be the division heads, department directors, confidential employees, those are the ones that I mean, I really do not know what's here. And so I just want to express that concern about this one. Thank you. Mr. Board, uh, or Mr. Nick, I respond, or Council Member Von Hayes. Yes. And Mr. Uh, Board. <laughs> I can respond to that very easily. Uh, I've had the opportunity to work on the, as the council rep on the negotiating committee, and also for the last day and day and this morning, I've been involved with these agreements. This meet and confer group has an actual document, just like a contract, but it's a meet and confer rather than a negotiated labor contract. And all we're doing is the same thing that we're doing with any of the other contracts. Uh, we're extending the current information that's in there that we approved two years ago for this group with the added items that were stipulated here on the agreement. Yes. And so these are consistent with what we have done in the past. Uh, it's where we sat down with the people this this morning we sat down with them we discussed the various issues that were out there we talked about any changes to their existing document that should be made or not made and I must say that in the last day and a half here I've had the opportunity to sit in front of all of the groups and it was very interesting and I'm very appreciative to the efforts that they all put forward to try and make our city a positive and better place. They all agreed to work together, and I think this is very important for us here in the city, is that we keep a positive, cohesive unit and try to keep things as fair as possible between all of the employee groups. We do have the fire and the police that we have to take a look at in the future, but what this does with all of these agreements that basically we've been able to keep in place the current documents we have with major improvements to help the efficiency of the city. And one of the key things in there is the health insurance where we have the flexibility that if needed to make adjustments to protect both the employees and the city. And I think this is the thing that we've tried to do here and we've been very effective to do it. And the collective bargaining process of this has worked very efficiently and again just in closing I would like to thank all the representatives of the units and the meet and confer groups for the positive attitudes they brought forward to the meetings and the helpful suggestions they made to us so we could come up with a very positive agreement to benefit not just the employees of the city but the taxpayers and keep us as a very, so we can continue to provide the needed services to the citizens of Eau Claire. Councilmember Okay, I just want to follow up a little bit. Um, I, I too have had the opportunity to attend a couple of them, so it was really a, an eye opener. And I think any time that you have this opportunity to have that dialogue, it ultimately means good results in terms of greater efficiencies for both the city of Eau Claire and the taxpayer. My question still that goes unanswered here is any individual contracts included in this section? And I guess Mr. Bohr would be the one to answer that. Mr. Bohr, I guess we have a lingering question. Thank you. Um, perhaps you could restate your question. Is there any individual contracts included in this section in terms of saying clerical and technical that I can for a neat group? engineering, department directors, division heads, and confidential employees. If, if I could speak to that, the only individual contract, as I understand it, between the individual um, and the city is the, the employment agreement between the city and me, and that's not included in this. That will be addressed separately. 
I appreciate that answer. Thank you. Mr. Moore, additions? No, I think that handles it. Thank you. As I understand it, then individual means one person, and we well, have one such contract. That is no question without the Councilmember Jux. Uh, Councilmember Pavelski and I had the opportunity to discuss this very thing earlier, and I too had some questions about that. I did speak with our Human Resources Director, Dale Peters, who's uh, out of town conducting a, would you believe it, a workshop, a very large one for 183 people, uh, dealing with some of the very issues we've been talking about and what to expect uh, in, the, in the coming weeks and months with implementation. Uh, his answer to this was that this is an extension of a contract that we've had before, uh, one that was ratified two years ago, and has some of the similar provisions to other contracts, but uh, it, we are just adding those provisions this time. Uh, and uh, uh, But he said, in truth, he said, this is something we probably want to look at as a policy matter at some point of how we deal with these things, uh, because all of this is going to be shifting in the next uh, couple of years as we phase out of one set of contracts and looking at how we uh, handle this under the whatever the new law is. Uh, but again, uh, uh, let's let's hope this is the beginning of a new day and we can move forward because the last month has been a struggle for a lot of people and uh, uh, we have a lot of friends and associates that we know are concerned and worried and I guess what can we say but we offer mutual support to one another here and to our uh, co-workers and other people in the field that are, are serving the public good. Thank you. Further discussion on item four? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Kincaid? Aye. Olson? Aye. Pavelski? Aye. Von Hayden? Aye. Vu? Aye. Wax? Aye. Worthman? Aye. Balo? Aye. Duax? Aye. Kemp? Aye. And that resolution passes and brings to an end uh, our meeting for this afternoon. Uh, we do have uh, um, an agenda item announcements and directives, Mr. City Manager. None. Directives by Council. Well, uh, that's, that's, that's a good point. We uh, uh, we will be canceling the six o'clock meeting. We were waiting on the outcome of this meeting, so the uh, six o'clock council meeting will be canceled. We'll send out that note. A notice will be sent to the media regarding the cancellation of the 6, 6 p.m. meeting. Seeing no further business before this council, on a motion by Councilmember Von Hayden, seconded by Councilmember Duex, this meeting is adjourned without a motion. You have been watching a special meeting of the Eau Claire City Council, recorded Thursday, March 10, 2011.